<laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Lincoln Home National Historic Site. My name is Tim Towns, and I'm the uh, Chief of Interpretation and Historian here at the site. And it's it's a great pleasure to have you all here. It's always a great pleasure to 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 be involved with an event with our partners with Pres Lincoln Presidential Foundation. Um, over the past few years, we've I think accomplished remarkable things here. If you haven't seen, as an example, if you haven't seen it yet, our new uh, youth exhibits in the Corneau House has just been remarkable. Um, and this is the time of year for youth. Uh, a lot of field trips this time of year, so we're just grateful for that. These these types of events um, and are, are another just wonderful opportunity for us, and especially this evening with, with Harold. We've been talking about, reminiscing about last time Harold was here and, and remembering uh, my predecessor and friend, George Painter, who, who, was, who was here um, and passed away uh, way too early, but but uh, it's just time to remember George as well. But um, it, it, uh, another program we're working on with the Presidential Foundation is, speaking of, of the youth, is, is, an, is a program initiative we're trying to do a little more with those students who come on field trips. It's, it's such a great opportunity. For the month of May, we're gonna have probably about 11,000 students coming from, from uh, mainly the Chicago area, but literally all over the state of Illinois. And we're working with um, the Lincoln Presidential Foundation and, and, and UIS and the Lincoln Center there um, to try to do more, engage, take advantage of that opportunity to engage those students just a little bit more, although their day is packed as they come down here. But we're going to try to do a little more and looking forward to that initiative. And we're working on that with another great partner. Um, at, at UIS at the Center for Lincoln Studies and its director, Jake Freyfeld. So Jake, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, I'm not gonna talk very long because you're not here to hear me talk. Um, but this is one of those nights where we're reminded why Springfield is such a special place. We're in Lincoln's neighborhood here to listen to a renowned, world-class Lincoln scholar talk about an understudied part of Lincoln's legacy. And this program grew out of conversations uh, Aaron Mast and I had with Harold at the Lincoln Forum, a wonderful event Harold puts on every year in um, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And <laughs> it grew into a partnership with the Lincoln Presidential Foundation and the National Park Service, the Lincoln Historic Site. And I, it's a, been a wonderful partnership. And I'm glad we're continuing to partner on the internship opportunities. And I hope it's a, two of many partnerships going forward. So I want to thank you both for the, uh, the wonderful experience of partnering with you. And now I think I want to turn it over to the executive director of the Lincoln Presidential Foundation, uh, Aaron Mast. <clears throat> Thank you, Jake. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the board and staff of Lincoln Presidential Foundation, I'm pleased that you're joining us this evening, both in person and we have about 300 people joining us for the live stream. And thank you to Cody from UIS for helping us with that tonight. Um, we're pleased to present this, our final Four Score Speaker Series program of the year, featuring Harold Holzer on his newest book, Brought Forth on This Continent, Abraham Lincoln and American Immigration. And in a first, we are hosting this as a live program in addition to the live stream. So for those who regularly join our online webinar, tonight's presentation will be a little bit different, but we will, of course, have time for audience Q&A at the end for both everyone in the room and online. I also want to thank Bill and Julie Cellini. They aren't here with us this evening, but they generously supported this event. And thank you, of course, to our friends at Lincoln Home National Historic Site for hosting us. Tim, we appreciate your partnership and are proud of being part of this historic neighborhood. And thank you to our friends at University of Illinois Springfield, um, the Center for Lincoln Studies, for collaborating with us tonight on this program, and especially to Jake Freefeld. We really appreciate your incredible partnership and your friendship and for making the most of Harold's time here. And thank you on that note to Edith. Edith, where are you? Thank you, Edith, <laughs> for allowing us to extend the trip by a few more days <laughs> and have you here with us in Springfield. I also wanna thank Lincoln Presidential Foundation board members who are here with us tonight. We have Governor Edgar and Mrs. Edgar. Thank you for being here. Kevin Conlin, thank you for coming down from Chicago, Kevin, and Barry Hines, who is here with us too. 
Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Harold Holzer. Now, if I read Harold's actual biography, we would have no time left for the program itself. So I'm giving you an abridged version of an abridged version of Harold's um, bio. So Harold is the Jonathan F. Fanton Director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College in New York, a post he assumed in 2015 after 23 years as Senior Vice President of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. For 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, he also served as co-chairman of the U.S. Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, appointed by President Clinton, and for the six years following as chairman of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation. In 2008, Holzer was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush. In 2013, he wrote the Lincoln essay in the official program for the re-inauguration of President Obama. He also serves as chairman of the Lincoln Forum, which Jacob mentioned earlier. And if you haven't been to that program in Gettysburg, I encourage you all to check it out this year. Harold Holzer is the author, co-author, or editor of 56 books on Lincoln and the Civil War. His Lincoln and the Power of the Press won the 2015 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. And that's the last book that you came to speak about in Springfield, isn't it right? Yeah. As well as awards from the Harvard Kennedy School and the Columbia School of Journalism. He will be speaking tonight on his latest book, again, brought forth on this continent, Abraham Lincoln and American Immigration, published in February 2024. Please join me in welcoming Harold Holzer. Thank you. It is really great to be back in, in Springfield. It's been 10 years, and um, I want to thank Aaron for making it possible and Jake for, be, for making it possible and being the perfect host for two and a half days. I have sampled, we have sampled every restaurant in Springfield <laughs> and they are really good and um, we have overordered. well I have overordered. so it's going to be, I'm going into a health regimen as soon as I get back to New York. Um, I don't want to bore everybody with more thank yous, but I do want to thank, um, express my thanks to and gratitude to all of the Springfield friends who helped me with the, all of whom are going to heckle me either. I see one already <laughs> starting. Um, because I conducted a lot of the research for most of the research for this book online uh, because of the pandemic and the lockdown. I did not, this is the first book I've done in 20 years for which I did not come to Springfield to do research. And it, but thanks to people like Christian McWhorter and his staff and Sam Wheeler and um, people who were just so generous. Megan Clintworth, who I met today at, uh, at the archives, uh, who, whom I've corresponded with but hadn't met, um, and, and all of you. And so special thanks today um, to an old friend in many senses of the word, but young at heart, I got to visit Wayne Temple today um, and spend time with this hundred and a quarter year old Marvel. He talked for about 90 minutes straight um, <laughs> in between bites of a cheeseburger and onion rings, which he finished. And um, I should have taken notes because words of wisdom and reminiscence and his memories of the the 1950s Lincoln world are so precious. I'm so happy that someone is doing a biography of Doc and that he's able with such vibrancy to participate in it. So it's just been, um, I see Sam Wheeler, did I thank Sam? He helped me as well with the book. But Wayne, okay, I sent him, it's almost like a good luck charm for me. And I hate that I thought of it as kind of a perfunctory gesture. But I've always sent Wayne manuscripts to look at because he is one of the greatest fact checkers on Lincoln on earth, right? I mean, he was 97 and a half, so I sent him the first few chapters of Brought Forth, and he sent me penciled notes in a beautiful hand, I will say, useful notes, and also shared with me a discovery that he made and said, you know, I may only get to write two or three more books. Um, <laughs> so you take this story. And he found the story, it's about Lincoln's Secretary John Nicolay, um, who very likely, as, as Wayne has discovered and proven, never got his citizenship papers. And on Election Day 1860, probably voted illegally. <laughs> Germans and Irish always said they were each voting illegally. So thank you to, to him. And it's just 
great to see Tim Townsend and Catherine Harris always, whether it's here or in Gettysburg. And, and Governor and Mrs. Edgar, I'm very honored by your presence and can't help thinking about all of the wonderful ALA days where you hosted us all in the mansion for all those years. And it's wonderful to see you looking so well. And both of you, thank you for coming. So that's it. No. Um, <laughs> I have to get to the topic. And I'm going to talk about what Lincoln might have called troublous times. He used that expression once in a letter. I love it. Uh, troublous times. Um, because the immigration issue was troublous in Springfield and in the rest of the country. And I suppose that the best we can say of Lincoln, and it's very good, is that he handled the issue, although he was very political about it, very tactical about it. He really handled it in the end with malice toward none. And that's, and that's key to knowing where his heart was as well as his political head. But I'm going to start officially, at long last, with a Lincoln who is not always associated with the phrase malice toward none, um, Mary Lincoln. And in the presidential campaign year of 1856, she sat restlessly on the sidelines, as she always did, did, because she was a highly intelligent woman who would have loved to be in the political fray, but that was not the sphere that was available to women. Um, and so she watched uh, as her husband ran um, to be a, an elector for first-time Republican presidential candidate John C. Vermont. Um, at the same time, Stephen Douglas, of course, was rallying voters for James Buchanan. But there was a third party candidate that year. Um, he was himself a former president, Millard Fillmore, running on the so-called, and it sounds benign today, American Party ticket, which in fact represented a coalition of anti-Catholic, anti-immigration, nativists, and know-nothings, all neatly bundled under the theme of Young America and the title American Party. So that campaign year was fueled by an avalanche of really shocking anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant literature. You know, in the days when candidates didn't campaign for themselves, people got their, their campaign highs from newspapers or books or pamphlets. And I read a lot of 1856 literature for, for this book, including a lurid genre called convent literature. Um, which was usually about priests who were seducing nuns in convents. And that was their real reason for them entering the priesthood. There was one by a woman named Mariah Monk called Awful Disclosures of the Hotel Nunnery in Montreal. Christian, you know, Canada, it's, everything happens in Canada. <laughs> right, that's French Canada. So again, a tale of, of, of priests and their sexual predations against novitiates. It sold three million copies in 1856 and 1857. What was the only book that sold more? Can you guess? The Bible. Oh, <laughs> Uncle Tom. Right, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Well, you're, you're probably right about the Bible, because if you look on Amazon, that's always number one. I shouldn't have asked. But it, it sold almost as many copies as Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and this book was augmented by political screeds, like a defense of the American policy, which was meant to inflame native-born workers against, quote, the ruinous competition of foreigners. And uh, even the know-nothing almanac, you know, everybody relied on almanacs for weather predictions. This one had weather predictions, but it also had warnings right with the lunar phases of the moon. It said, beware of foreign immigrants swarming like vermin through the land. Yes, they, they used the word vermin then. You know, inexcusable to use any time, but it was used then as well. So, you know, tapping into this deep veil of suspicion and hostility, the American Party got 22% of the vote in 1856. Only one state fell to the Fillmore, but it was more than enough to deny Fremont and the Republicans a victory in, its, in the Republicans' first contest. So you probably know all this. A week or so after the election, Mary Lincoln took up her pen to write to her sister Emily in Lexington, 
to comment on the results of this campaign that she couldn't participate in. And this is what she wrote. My weak woman's heart was too Southern in feeling to sympathize with anyone but Fillmore. Why? Because, as she said, he feels the necessity of keeping foreigners within bounds. And as she explained, if some of you Kentuckians had to deal with the wild Irish, as we housekeepers are sometimes called upon to do in Springfield, the South would certainly elect Mr. Fillmore next time. Maybe she was joking. Maybe she wasn't. So next time, as we know, with the help of um, neither Southerners nor Irishmen or wild Irishmen, her husband was nominated. <laughs> and as his reputation grew, so did hers, interestingly, as a kind of very difficult taskmaster of her Irish household help. Um, the wild Irish maids that she complained about, who were sent west by agencies as they stepped off the boats in New York City, Boston, and Philadelphia. Um, it's useful to remember what immigration was like in this period. What did it take uh, to, to come to the United States and, and eventually attain citizenship? And I want to say at the outset, I'm talking and my book talks about European immigration. Lincoln, like almost all of his contemporaries, Grant, others, had a blindness toward the potential for Asian immigration and they were generally upset about it because Californians told them they were upset about it. Um, my book acknowledges but doesn't deal repeatedly with the fact that a lot of the lands that were made available to the foreign born were indigenous lands, um, to access to which indigenous people were denied. And it mentions, but I'm not going to focus on it tonight, the, the irony of ironies is that some of the early Americans who opposed immigration were perfectly happy with the forced immigration of Africans. Mm -hmm. And that the, even the people who, who came to favor immigration in the Lincoln era were also talking about voluntary emigration back, quote, back to Africa, even for people who had lived here for generations. So all that has to be part of this very complex story. But what did it take for a European? an Irish man or a German to establish himself in the United States? Well, there were no walls. There was no ice. There was no razor wire. Uh, there were no DACA students because they didn't need to be, no dreamers. If you came, you, and it usually in the, especially with the Irish, was part of what we now sometimes derisively call chain migration which was a good thing because people who came had a family to go to to shelter them. You came, you arrived in New York City, 70% from 1840 to 1860 arrived in New York City, or Boston or Philadelphia. And five years after you registered your arrival, your country of origin, your gender, your age, you could swear allegiance to the United States and become a citizen. Five years, except during the period of the Alien and Sedition Act when the um, time limit was temporarily 14 years, and there were expulsions based on nationality. So it was remarkably easy. Um, the Constitution gave the federal government no power to regulate immigration, by the way. Naturalization, yes. Immigration, no. And when I see columnists still today say that there's a constitutional power to to, for the federal government to do immigration. It's not in the Constitution. It was uh, later legislated as a federal power based um, on the Commerce Clause. And the Supreme Court said that the federal government had, had the power. But there was no federal authority. The policing of immigration was left to the states. And most states were kind of OK with welcoming new workers who were willing to start on the bottom of the economic ladder. Now, some states did do some tricky things with immigration. They would impose head taxes of a dollar, and that became known in Ireland, for example. Um, and that was, as they say, to limit the arrival of idiots and indigent. So yes, there was bad <coughs> language associated with immigration from the beginning. Or states would limit the amount of tonnage that a ship could carry to a city. 
as a result of which shipping companies would move people off before they moved goods because goods were more profitable to, to move. Again, five years and you could become a citizen. So Springfield, <coughs> as I write in the book, became a refuge for Irish and German refugees, most, most Catholic at first and primarily democratic. And some rose in politics in the early period of immigration here and elsewhere, like Gustav Kerner. Um, and I spend a lot of time on Kerner, who emigrated in 1833, which was 15 years before German immigration really cascaded in the United States, was elected to Congress in 42, um, the same year that uh, Lincoln rekindled his courtship of Mary Lincoln, by the way. Um, our, our less than enthusiastic supporter of immigration. Um, and maybe we should have known from the, from the wooing period how Mary really felt because Lincoln's rekindling of the courtship after their broken relationship, whatever the, whether it was standing her up at the altar or just breaking up, how do they get back together? Well, they got back together in the publisher, in the, in the office of the publisher of the newspaper. So I write, wrote about this in my press book, but now I have an ethnic slant on it. Because what was Mary doing? She was writing screeds, satires about James Shields, mm -hmm. the state auditor, who was an Irish American. More importantly to Lincoln, he was a Democrat. So he was damnable and he was trying to call in some state bonds early that would have ruined people. So Lincoln helped Mary with the articles, James Shields. Um, didn't like what he read and demanded to know who wrote the articles and the publisher, after checking with Lincoln, said it was Lincoln and you probably all know that they went off to fight a duel. Um, I still have questions about that. How far did they go? It's a long way to go to fight this duel on Bloody Island in, on the Missouri side of the Mississippi River where dueling was legal. We'll get back to Shields later, but um, one of the things Mary wrote is, if I was deaf and blind, I could tell James Shields from the smell. Not very nice. <laughs> so you know that Lincoln chose broadswords as the weapon. And then he practiced by shearing off the branches of low-hanging branches of trees, after which Shields suddenly forgot that there was a duel. He said, why don't we shake hands and make up? You're, you're, too, you're too tough. So, Keep that in mind. By the way, I just saw the broadsword type at the Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. It is a big weapon. So I don't mind, I don't, I'm not surprised that Shields was intimidated when Lincoln wielded it so proficiently. So two global events really heightened immigration in this country and made it the kind of issue that propelled the know nothing and nativist movements in the 50s. And that was the failure of potato crops in Ireland in 1845, and the failure of the liberal uh, anti-monarchy revolutions on the continent in 1848. Within a decade, more than a million more European immigrants flooded into the US, both the people seeking food and the people seeking freedom, or both. Um, and not everyone uh, welcomed them when the numbers were so great especially those who posited that the new arrivals had more loyalty to the pope than they did to the president, more loyalty to their local priest than they would to an alderman or a mayor. And in 1844, the year that Lincoln uh, first tried but failed to win a congressional nomination here, a huge anti-Catholic riot erupted in Philadelphia. Um, two churches were destroyed, lives were lost, Church libraries were thrown into the street um, and destroyed, set on fire. The governor twice called the National Guard to put down these riots. They were serious. And the Whig Party was accused of being so publicly uh, hostile to these immigrants, not just because they were Catholic, but because they were enrolling in the Democratic Party. I think that was the seed of their, of their hostility, that Whigs across the country were kind of required to explain their position openly on immigration. So in 1844, Lincoln attends such a meeting here in Springfield and passes his first test on openness about immigration. He writes the draft 
for this Whig political meeting that is adopted. And it goes on record saying, denying hostility to foreigners and Catholics and insisting that the path to citizenship be as open, convenient, cheap, and expeditious as possible. That's a good statement for 1844. Even the Democratic paper in town, the Register, paid him a kind of a backhanded compliment that said that Lincoln expressed his personal views, not the Whig Party views, because the Whigs were, were irredeemably hostile. But even as the Whig Party faded in Springfield and elsewhere, hostility to Catholic immigrants um, never ebbed. So by the 1850s, we have the development of this open, know-nothing movement, these secret club meetings, um, but real political gains. The know-nothings elected uh, uh, a mayor of Chicago. Um, it elected members of Congress, mayors, a mayor of New York City. Um, um, Samuel F.B. Morse was a, extremely hostile to foreigners and Catholics and wrote, when he wasn't painting or inventing the telegraph, was publishing books about how awful Catholics were. Um, James Harper, who founded a publishing empire in New York City, uh, Harper's Weekly and then Harper and Brothers Publishers, uh, was elected mayor of New York as a nativist. So this is metastasizing throughout the country. So where is Lincoln going now? Well, the Whig Party is gone. He is not a nativist, as he'll later make explicit. But as he begins to, oh, by the way, just a segue to 1855, because who, who does Lincoln defeat? Who does Lincoln, well, he doesn't win, but he causes the defeat of our friend James Shields, who keeps coming back into our story. He loses his Senate seat in 1855. It's Trumbull who gets it, but Lincoln almost gets it. And by the way, that following year, this town publishes a newspaper, a brief, briefly alive newspaper called the Springfield Capital, a, a name that's kind of benign and generic and disguises the fact that it was an openly nativist, anti-Catholic paper right here in town. And by the way, it was owned, not, not condemning Mary again, you know, I kind of like Mary, <laughs> but the publisher is the brother-in-law of Mary's sister. So not related by blood or even one degree of separation. Kind of all in the family, though. Um, so what does Lincoln have to do now? He has to navigate these roiling political waters in Springfield and Illinois. He's primarily interested in creating and um, pledging allegiance to the new anti-slavery Republican Party. And of course, his focus is anti-slavery. It's all about anti-slavery. but. Whom does he attract to this new umbrella? Well, there are Whigs who have nowhere to go. There are anti-Kansas Nebraska Act Democrats who don't want to stay in the Democratic Party. But there are also the, that 22% who voted for the nativists a couple of years earlier, or would vote for the nativists in 56. He wants them. He wants them to abandon the third party and join the Republicans, unite around anti-slavery. But he can't exactly embrace them publicly. A, because he's not an anti-Catholic and he's not a nativist, but, and, and politically he does not want them to go elsewhere or maintain third party status. I quote um, William Herndon in the book who says at one point, Lincoln harbored no prejudice against any class, preferring the Germans, yet tolerating as I never could the Irish. That's quite a quote. So where is Lincoln going? No one is sure. And in 1855, his best friend writes him from Kentucky, and we don't know what his letter said because Lincoln didn't keep letters until he had that German secretary, John Nicolay, <laughs> to keep order in the, in the, in the governor's rooms. Um, I assume Speed said, what the heck are you doing politically? I'm reading all sorts of weird things. Are you joining the know-nothings? And, and uh, Lincoln writes a very famous letter. I'm sure most of you have heard it. I am not a know-nothing, that is certain. How could I be? How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? And he goes on. It's, every biographer uses this quote to show how Lincoln was resisting the nativist movement. So 
I suggest in the book that it doesn't show anything of the kind. It's a letter to his friend. And Josh Speed does not make that letter public until the year after Lincoln's assassination. He does write a similar letter to Owen Lovejoy, an abolitionist who he wasn't crazy about, as Christian reminded me when he showed me a letter uh, now on view at the library that, uh, that's where Lincoln is horrified that Lovejoy has gotten a congressional nomination. But he writes to Lovejoy and he says basically the same thing. We can't be know-nothings. But to Lovejoy, who is a political operative in Illinois, he adds, the know-nothings have not entirely tumbled to pieces. Its elements are kind of up for grabs. He calls them the elements. I fear an open push by us now against the know-nothings may offend them and prevent our ever getting them. I have no objection to fuse with anybody, provided I can fuse on ground that I think is right. Meaning, as long as they're against slavery, let's kind of turn the other cheek or turn a blind eye, stand with anybody who stands right on anti-slavery. So Lincoln is kind of being a little bit two-faced about it, a little bit uh, disobliging. Uh, it comes to home to haunt him a bit in 1858, the year, of course, of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And um, Lincoln accepts it, of course, down the block. I hope I'm pointing, I'm very bad at directions. State Capitol, somewhere? Over there. Oh, somewhere. Thank you, Sam. Um, and um, that meeting was presided over by Gustav Kerner, by the way, the former, now former lieutenant governor who was chairman of the convention that nominates Lincoln. But he's, he's uh, squeezed in a vice, having not condemned them publicly, and that emboldens Douglas and the Democrats to accuse him. Now it gets ugly, really ugly at this point. Lincoln is secretly plotting to give voting rights to black people, but he doesn't want to give voting rights to Irish people. So one Illinois newspaper says, Lincoln entertains a holy horror of all Irishmen and other adopted citizens who have sufficient self-respect to believe themselves superior to black people. As I say, it's pretty ugly. He would disenfranchise every one of the Irish if he had the power. So again, he can't publicly get into it. But I looked, again, his heart and his head are a little bit in two different places at this point. He does make two statements in debate season that I kind of cherish, one of them very informal. He says that the West should be open to Hans and Baptiste and Patrick, the German, the French, and the Irish, and all other men from all over the world. There they can find new homes and better their conditions in life. Now excluded black people from that comment but he was embracing the Irish for the first time publicly. That's in a debate. But I also love something he said in Chicago right after Independence Day. Douglas had spoken the night before. Lincoln comes the next day to rebut him. It's not the formal debates, but it's debate-like in, in the structure of speech and rejoinder. Now for context, because nothing is perfect, Lincoln had been invited to a German picnic in Chicago, P-I-C-N-I-C-K, I love that, in the newspapers, on July 4th. I don't understand why he didn't go. There's nothing in the record, but he didn't go. He declined. He sent a message or maybe didn't. He liked Springfield on July 4th. He liked the patriotic displays in his hometown, but he didn't go. And then he read in the press that every politician in Northern Illinois went there and they, the Republicans did so well, they pressed the flesh with German voters. So here he comes on July 11th, rebutting Douglas. And he looks in the front row of this vast crowd outside the Tremont House, and he sees a German leader named Anton Hessing, who is very recognizable because he's a huge guy and he's sitting right up front. And Lincoln is about to pay tribute to the founding generation. But I think seeing Hessing and realizing that he'd made a little bit of a political blunder by not appearing, this is what he says. Um, We're here to salute the race of men living in the day of the, of the revolution and their descendants. 
Besides the men descended by blood from our ancestors, he adds, there are the Germans, the Irish, the French, and the Scandinavian, men that have come from Europe themselves or whose ancestors have come here and settled here, finding themselves our equals in all things. If they look back through our history to trace their connection with the revolutionary days by blood, they find none. But when they look through the Declaration of Independence, they find it says all men are created equal and that they have a right to claim that moral promise as though they were the blood of the blood and the flesh of the flesh of the men who wrote the Declaration, and so they are. That was an extraordinary thing to say at that moment, knowing that he needed nativists to beat Stephen Douglas. Um, it doesn't mean he doesn't go home and imagine massive Irish voter fraud happening to deprive him of the Senate. He writes a letter and says, I just saw two Irishmen at the train station carrying carpet bags. We should hire detectives because I'm sure they're going to cast fake votes against me. So he's back and forth, back and forth. And, and you know, he loses, he loses the Senate race, as you all know. Next year, another big public test on immigration. Massachusetts decides to extend the time required in the state to achieve voting rights in Massachusetts. Republicans around the country, now looking at the presidential race coming up the next year, are sure that this is going to divide their base. Nativists on one side, immigrants on the other. By then, the Germans are almost are ma as massively Republican as the, well, maybe not quite, but almost as pro-Republican as the Irish are pro-democratic. And in Illinois, of course, another meeting. You guys love to have meetings in Springfield. So there was another meeting, uh, another group to condemn the Massachusetts Amendment. Lincoln did not go. He sent Herndon. Um, and Herndon made a speech opposing Massachusetts. And the organizer of the meeting, a newspaper editor from Alton named Theodore Canisius, came to Lincoln and said, you've got to speak too. So Lincoln wrote a really wonderful letter in which he said, again, it mirrors the letter to Josh Speed. I should be strangely inconsistent if I could favor any project for curtailing the existing rights of white men, even though born in different lands and speaking different languages for myself, considering I'm devoted to the oppressed condition of the black man. Um, and that's how he framed it. Well, the letter is published in the State Journal. It gets great response. Canisius now has a pigeon in his crosshairs. The pigeon is Abraham Lincoln. And as some of you may know from my earlier books or just because you know, Canisius had just abandoned his anti-slavery Republican newspaper in Alton, which was not a great place for anti-slavery newspapers, we know from <laughs> Elijah Lovejoy's problems. Um, and he came to Springfield to relocate it, where a German banker I think John Burkhart seized his printing press for back debts. And Canisius goes to Lincoln and says, um, if you give me $500, you can own the newspaper. It can be your newspaper. It's a German language newspaper. Lincoln has taken German classes here in Springfield, but he was such a cut up that the class had to be disbanded. And as <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the people who wasted his tuition said, no one learned any German. All Lincoln remembered was that George Schneider, a German newspaper editor in Chicago, he said to him once, your name means Taylor. And Schneider said, I know. But th that, <laughs> that was the extent. So it's a whole separate story. I've actually spoken about it here in Springfield, so I won't do more. But Lincoln did own this, secretly own this German language newspaper that he could not read for a year and change and gave it back to Canisius. Um, as promised, once the presidential election was done and he had fulfilled his contractual obligation to be loyal to the Republican platforms. I think, Christian, you have one copy here in no, there's no of the contract. Oh, the contract, yes. You have yes. one contract and the John Hay Library yes. has the other copy. Mm -hmm. No, no one has the Satz Anzeiger, right? If, you, if anybody goes home and finds that, <laughs> get in touch with Christian McWhorter. Yeah because he has a, an acquisitions fund that will lavishly reward you for the discovery. 
So Lincoln wins the 1860 nomination, as you know, without huge convention support from Germans. I know a recent book says, suggests otherwise, but uh, Karl Schurz, the most famous German leader in the country, is beginning to end for William Seward. He had never abandoned Seward. But he does come down here. Kerner comes down here to Springfield after the Chicago Convention to notify Lincoln and get on his good side. Shirt says, I greeted him. I didn't like what he was wearing. <coughs> he was too informal. And he grabbed my hand, <laughs> shake my hand, and say he didn't hold his Seward loyalty against him. And after the handshake, he writes to his wife, ouch. That was his <laughs> response. This is the result of speaking very loudly to Wayne Temple for an hour and a half today. <laughs> <coughs> it was worth it. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to take a cough drop here. Lincoln's victory means that Owen oh, Schertz and Kerner campaigned all over Illinois, Wisconsin. Kerner spoke, uh, Schertz spoke at Cooper Union in New York. And they rallied the German vote for Lincoln in the fall. Whether it was dispositive, whether it made the difference, very hard to tell. People have gone through precinct records. But there's not enough sophisticated delving into the ethnic backgrounds of voters to know they really helped. And, now, and having helped, they expected a political reward. Carl Schurz wanted desperately to be ambassador. I'll say ambassador. It was called minister, but to, for, to make it simple, ambassador to Mexico. Then he settled on ambassador to, Sta to Spain. Kerner wanted a major job. Schertz gets the Spanish post. Kerner gets nothing. Kerner is really upset. Now, Kerner had been absolutely loyal to Lincoln for 25 years. And Kerner was also upset that Canisius didn't get a job. And he pushed for Canisius before he pushed for himself. Canisius got a consulate and a bonus when all of those Staatsanzigers were bought by the legislature. That was a little deal that Lincoln arranged so that there would be no back copies that could be traced to him. Um, Schertz was named to be ambassador to Spain, and then Fort Sumter. Schertz is packing his famous pistols in Wisconsin. He had, had, a, he had helped engineer a prison breakout during the 1848 revolutions. And he was a soldier. He rushes to Washington, where Seward has been reluctant to approve him as an ambassador, which is really bizarre. Talk about ingratitude. But Seward didn't believe that revolutionaries should be sent overseas to royal courts, not if we wanted Spain or France to remain neutral in the Civil War. So Schertz was held up. And he said, well, you know what? I'm going to organize a regiment. I'm going to New York. As it turned out, he was late to doing that. But let me switch to my, I've talked a lot about Springfield. Now I'm going to boast about my hometown, New York. One week after Sumter, 100,000 people rallied at Union Square to call for volunteers to fight the rebellion. The flag of Fort Sumter was brought there. And it was suspended from the statue of George Washington, then the biggest statue in the United States, still there. What's in the park now, it was, it was south of the park then. And there were actually two rallies, one for the elites and one for the immigrants. But German after German, Irishman after Irishman, stood up to say, we have to rally for that flag, not our flag of old. We, the Germans would say things like, we love our fatherland, but this country took us in. And now we're going to defend her. And the Irish, there were a couple of speakers who said, we didn't like Abraham Lincoln particularly. We didn't vote for him. But he's the president. He's the commander in chief. He's called for 75,000 volunteers. And the result was a huge number. The advantage of the early Union Army is that all the immigrants, the preponderant number of immigrants, had come to northern cities where there was economic opportunity. Why go to Charleston or Savannah when you're entering a slave system and there is no opportunity? And immigrants knew that. And then they followed their relatives. So there was huge enlistment. 
Lincoln wanted two, three Irishmen at the very beginning. Michael Corcoran, a leader of the Fenian Brotherhood. Thomas Francis Marr, a former British prisoner in Tasmania who had escaped and become quite famous in New York. And the third, James Shields, his old dueling rival, now twice a, a, Uni as a United States senator. He had served from another state. He was, in, he was actually in Mexico when the war broke out. And the, the Archbishop of New York, John Hughes, suggested Shields be included. Why? Because there were great generals? Not particularly, but because they were recruiting magnets. Corcoran is enlisted right away, leads the Fighting Irish, the 69th, to Bull Run, where he's captured in about an hour. Marr takes over. He has a very spotty record in the service. Grant eventually drums him out for drinking too much. It's got to, got to take a lot of drinking for Grant to think that you overindulge. Shields comes all the way east. Must have been very hard for Lincoln to welcome him to the White House. And, and for Mary to be reminded of what she thought was embarrassing. She didn't say, oh, my hero, you were willing to fight a duel. She said, Mr. Lincoln thought that was heroic, but you know, I didn't think so. Shields was a disaster. And by the way, the Senate pulled a, what we now call a Tommy Tuberville and did not approve his promotion to Major General. So he fought without rank. And then he ran into a dueling rival who was even tougher than Lincoln a guy named Stonewall Jackson. So Lincoln sent him back to California, and that was the end. Why was it important? Because when Shields, Corcoran, and Marr joined the Union Army, eventually 160,000 Irishmen joined the Union Army as well. With the Germans, it was a West, more of a Western phenomenon. Franz Sigel was the early recruiting hero. I fight Smith Sigel became a rallying cry in Missouri. Um, Schertz uh, did not raise a regiment in New York or elsewhere, so he went off. Um, by the way, Sigel proved most adept at organizing retreats. So he soon became known as the Flying Dutchman, which was the <laughs> second nickname. Now our friend Kerner gets involved in all of this, and I, I'd like to localize the story for Springfield. So well, Kerner was from Belleville, but you know he knew Lincoln here. Kerner is so despondent about not getting a diplomatic job that he raises a regiment in Illinois, meets Grant, actually, in Illinois. Um, and he joins, who was the commander of the Western Theater? John C. Fremont, the, the former uh, presidential candidate. And uh, Fremont, as you know, proposed an emancipation order for the Western Theater before Lincoln was ready to move. And also Lincoln believed it was his decision to make, not a field or a theater commander. So Lincoln replaces Fremont with General Henry Wager Halleck, um, who's not terribly popular with the Germans. Fremont is beloved by the Germans. And Halleck keeps telling people, but my father is German. They said, we don't care, we don't like you. <laughs> Lincoln sends Kerner to St. Louis with a sealed letter whose contents I'm sure Kerner didn't know. This is the way Lincoln liked to operate, the man of mystery. And he hands the letter to Halleck, and inside Lincoln writes, I want you to meet Gustav Kerner, the best German in the United States. I would like you to name him your chief aide in St. Louis. And get rid of Franz Sigel once and for all. Get him out of town, because he's really been a disaster. Well. Halleck says, I don't know why you need a German here. I'm German. That's when he protests. And he also does not want Lincoln's buddy standing over his shoulder in St. Louis. Besides which, Kerner, like everyone else before him of his nativity, fell in love with Franz Sigel. And he writes to Lincoln and says, you must keep Sigel. So it's a giant mess. I just wanted to bring Kerner back into, into, the, um, into the equation. And then we get to the highlight of Lincoln and his actions on immigration. It's 1863. Immigration has dwindled for several reasons. The Crimean War had tied up a lot of vessels. It couldn't be used for passengers. And also, people in Europe did not exactly relish the idea 
of emigrating to a country that was at bloody war with itself, especially after um, 1863, the draft. Um, what does Lincoln do? He, and, this, and this is something he writes two weeks after the Gettysburg Address, when he's down with smallpox, by the way, what I think was actually a serious case of smallpox. Um, it killed his valet, William Johnson, whom he first hired in Springfield and took with him to Washington. And um, Lincoln proposes the first federal immigration law. Expand the immigration stations like Castle Garden in New York City. Create a federal bureau of immigration. Not to stop or inhibit immigration. It's an act to encourage immigration. We need immigrants to fill our farms, our factories, and our mines. And obviously left unspoken is the fact that there have been half a million deaths in the war, probably to that point. So as Lincoln puts it, it's, it's a replenishment of society that we desperately need. As he writes, tens of thousands of persons destitute of occupation are thronging our foreign consulates and offering to emigrate if essential but very cheap assistance can be afforded them. This is a noble effort, and it demands the aid and support of the government. What does he propose? That the government pay for ocean passage for immigrants. That is a really revolutionary idea for 1863 or 2023 or 2024 or any time in between. And it, <coughs> it does prove a bridge too far for Congress, even his own fellow Republicans. One, um, the New York Times, which is as much an administration official organ as the journal was here in Springfield, they write, hired immigration would export to us the refuse of the sinks of Germany and Ireland. Every principality with lazy and wretched subjects who are a burden on the community would send them to the nearest seaport and let them take advantage of our government. So that didn't, it didn't happen. But the bill did include encouragement of private industry to provide lending plans at low interest for immigrants to borrow on their passage and come into the country. Critics say it was like indentiture, but I think it was actually a, a really good idea for people to have a payback plan for immigration. And by early summer 1864, a remarkable thing happened. Congress wrote an immigration law, and then when it came before them to vote, they actually voted for it, right? <laughs> they didn't say, what's that immigration law? I never heard of the one I just wrote. They actually voted for it. And it was the most remarkable immigration innovation of the 19th century. Um, and um, there was a, a, a second bill in 65 which cured some of the deficiencies of the first. Between that bill, which Lincoln didn't live to sign, it took 100 years for another immigration bill to be passed. The 1965 bill that Lyndon Johnson introduced to extend um, immigration opportunities to Southeast Asians, allies who had been displaced by the war in Southeast Asia. With all this, you would have thought that Germans would have rallied to Lincoln's reelection in 1864. But the enmity over Franz Sigel, of all things, was still hanging over Lincoln. Progressives in Missouri were angry that the emancipation did not extend to a border state. And we all know that there was a third party, briefly a third party candidacy in 1864. Our old friend John C. Fremont was nominated by uh, a third party, but it was really a German revolution. I, like, I checked the ethnicity of the delegates to that kind of rump convention a couple of weeks before the Republican convention. 70% of the delegates were German. And it took uh, Lincoln's firing of uh, Postmaster General Blair and other concessions to get that third party movement to to stop. And then Carl Schurz and Gustav Kerner went on the road. Kerner's back, 
Kerner actually went, Schertz came back from Spain and joined the army after all, fought at Gettysburg. Kerner was finally given the job of ambassador to Spain. Then he got depressed about not being in the war and he came back. So they're both fighting at this point. And once again, Schertz takes to the road and campaigns for Lincoln. Lincoln is reelected and he has one more annual message to Congress left in him. And here's where he says, I regard our emigrants as one of the principal replenishing streams which are appointed by providence to repair the ravages of internal war and its wastes of national strength and health. So think of that in relation to what else he was saying. In a private meditation he had written that if God wills that the war continue, then it will continue. In the inaugural address he will give in a couple of months, he will say that if God wills that every drop of blood drawn with the lash has to be repaid by one drawn with the sword, again, the war continues, then the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. But all but ignored is the fact that in between those messages, he suggests that God had also willed immigration. And Lincoln, as I said, does not live to sign it into law. But think of what the society was like as he left this life. Um, he dies in the home of a German immigrant tailor in Washington. He's tended by, among others, a Latvian-born ophthalmologist who is called in because of the, the darkening of his eye. It's thought that there's an ocular problem that an eye surgeon could, could uh, deal with. Um, his assassin is killed by a British-born soldier commanded by an Irish-born captain. The conspirator's execution, the assassination conspirator's execution is managed by a German officer and photographed by a Scottish cameraman, Alexander Gardner. When his remains arrive in New York City before they come back to Springfield, they're guarded by Thomas Francis Moore. The, the officer who had lost his job for over-imbibing, he was standing at the foot of the coffin for most of a procession of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, while below the stairs of New York City Hall, a German chorus was singing from Wagner. The multi-ethnicity of the moment cannot be lost. The voice of America had changed, and Lincoln had helped change it. And if we want to search for what he truly believed, I think we should go back to that speech in Chicago in 1858, in which he, he encouraged Illinoisans to embrace the foreign born as the flesh of the flesh and the blood of the blood of the very founders of, of the republic. Not to be political, but he never said that immigrants were poisoning the blood of America. He said they were enriching the blood of America. Um, he did not respond to immigrants, even those who opposed him, with an iron fist, but rather with an open hand. Even though immigrant call shirt said, ouch, he knew that it was an open hand welcoming immigrants. Um, as he said in Cincinnati, uh, en route to his inauguration, I esteem foreigners no better than any people, nor any worse. They are all of the great family of man. And I think despite all of his political calculations and moves, Abraham Lincoln really adhered to that. And the experience began here in Springfield. He knew no foreign born people until he arrived here. And he learned well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Harold. We have um, over a dozen questions that have already come in from online. Um, and we're going to balance these between questions in the room as well. Um, so the first one that we're going to ask, some of these you actually, they came in early enough that you can answer them, oh, good. Um, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, let's go with Greg's. For a party that gained over 20% of the popular vote in the 1856 presidential election, why did support for the no nothing party vanish so quickly, and to which party did its supporters migrate in subsequent elections? That's a good question. I forgot who 
utter the words of wisdom that a third party um, is like a bee sting. It hurts at the beginning and then it dies, right? The bee dies. I messed up that quote, Doesn't, <laughs> but that's the quote. Um, I think it's kind of a natural thing that a third party crescendos and is never heard from again if it's not tremendously successful. I mean, Ross Perot did well the first time, not well the second time. Um, and, and I think as Lincoln hoped, most of the elements of the nativist, the American party went to the Republicans, probably because he didn't publicly condemn them. Should he have morally? Maybe. Politically, he was smart to leave the door open and to convert people to kind of the crusade against slavery as a priority. Question from the audience. So, Harold, um, my name is Bob Bunn. Hi. And, uh, hi. And, um, related Bunch, to Bunch, I'm sure. I'm related to Bunch. I knew him. He was my father. Ah. And so, um, but in doing some family research, I discovered that Jacob Bunn and Nicholas Ridgely, so Jacob Bunn is my grand, great great grandfather on my father's side. Nicholas Ridgely is my great great grandfather on my mother's side. Whoa. As, it, oh. as it turned out, uh, when doing the research on that newspaper, that German newspaper that Lincoln um, bought, he sent Jacob Bunn in to uh, get the contract done. Yes. And because possibly he didn't want to be associated with the paper. And he had um, a law case with Nicholas Ridgely up in Peoria. And normally um, Lincoln is so shy about charging very much that he doesn't charge very much. But he charged. Um, um, the, the fellow up there was a land dispute. He, he charged him exactly the amount of money he needed to buy the five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. <laughs> Two hundred fifty of which really belonged to Herndon. Yeah. And Lincoln says to him, "Billy, we just bought a newspaper with your fee." <laughs> well, there you go. So you know the you know the story. Yeah. But, so uh, both grandparents were were involved in the in the transaction behind the scenes with that newspaper um, in Springfield. And he, well, on, the, the fellow, the, he bought it on the condition that this fellow adhere strictly to being positive. About exactly, him. exactly. Okay. I just have to say one quick thing. Yeah, I know you have other questions, but I have to say this. If it wasn't for your dad, I probably would never have gotten to, gone to work for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, you may wonder, how is that possible? Because I was hired by a man named William Lures, who was the president of the Met, and he was from Springfield. So when I was having my interview, I knew he was from Springfield. His family was in the shoe business. S right? You know Lures? He's, by the way, he's just written, he's 91 years old, he's just written his memoirs, um, in which I'm only mentioned once, but that's another story. <laughs> so I'm being interviewed by Lures, my last interview, and I've got this in my pocket, right? And I said, Ambassador, he was, we call, uh, until I knew him well, I called him Ambassador. He'd been Ambassador to to um, Spain? No, that was, that was Angie Duke, <laughs> Czechoslovakia. And I said, Ambassador, are you related to the Lures family, um, which made, um, which made uh, shoes? And he said, in the Lincoln era? And he said, how on earth did you know that? And I said, well, you know, I know Bunch Bun, I know Sally Schombacher, I know all. He said, oh my god, you're hired. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> It's always about Springfield, right? All right, next question from Nails. In what ways do you think Lincoln helped to integrate Jewish immigrants into the American mainstream during his presidency? Well, um, he certainly, I think his first Jewish friend was Abraham Jonas of Quincy, Illinois, um, who was a Whig, who by the way was supposed to be the best Whig orator in Illinois. Apparently Lincoln came in number two in this assessment. and. Um, it, Jonas would eventually help Lincoln overcome an 1860 rumor that he had visited a Know Nothing Lodge in Quincy. Grant admitted that he went to a Know Nothing Lodge in St. Louis. Lincoln denied it, and Jonas carried the message, and he never forgot that gesture. <coughs> when Jonas died with one of his Confederate children at the bedside, to whom Lincoln had given a pass, he made his wife the postmaster of Quincy. He wouldn't even do that for Elizabeth, his wife's uh, cousin. Um, didn't believe in women postmasters, but he made an exception. But the real serious stuff, one, he received 
and sympathized with the rules that forbade Jewish chaplains in the service. He saw to it that the, the original chaplaincy law said of some Christian denomination. Lincoln just changed it to re a recognized uh, minister of any faith and Congress passed it in 62. So that was a major thing. And of course, um, rejecting Grant's order number 11, which was kind of in, started a pogrom in the Western theater, especially in Paducah, Kentucky, where Jews actually left because they were told to leave, because Grant banned Jews as a class from the entire area under his jurisdiction. Again, very deft politically, Lincoln did not issue a condemnation of Grant or the order. He told our friend Henry Halleck to quietly um, renounce it, and that was a big deal. Thank you, Harold. Another question from the room? All right, this one comes from John Serna. He says that Lincoln, for all intents and purposes, never formally identified with a particular sect or church. Did that, quote, gap in any way influence his views on immigrants or immigration? That's a great question. Conceivably. Um, everyone who, all of the immigrants who visited Lincoln, or not all, many of the immigrants who visited Lincoln, in t including Jewish visitors, immediately decided that Lincoln really was of their faith. Um, including um, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise of Cincinnati, who didn't like Lincoln politically. Um, it's extraordinary that he seemed to be spiritual without being particularly aligned with one church or another. So I think that's the impact he had on people. We're gonna do one more here. Okay. Um, and this one is, how would you characterize the relationship between Lincoln and the radical Polish immigrant, Adam Karowski? Uh, oh, it never fails that the last question is always the trickiest question. <laughs> so you know- All the other ones are easy, girl, Yeah. So. Oh, is that why? <laughs> I, I was looking at it the wrong way. So Gorowski was kind of, I mean, he's always called a gadfly, which is a kind of a pejorative um, description of him. But you know, he was a government employee who kept a diary. He was not particularly fond of Lincoln, uh, but he was loyal to the Union. So he was a kind of a useful uh, uh, observer of things in Washington. I read, I've read each volume of his diary twice, and I can't really extrapolate much from it. I couldn't for the book. He's a gossip, <laughs> you know, in my view. Do we have to end on an anti-Polish note? Surely someone has one other. Are there any questions in the room? All okay, right, let there's me this sing one with that's more of a what if big picture question oh. about whether Lincoln would push for any specific policy or more so for a viable immigration policy. I, mean, I think the record shows, I mean, I know the country was sparsely populated then, um, but he was for expanding diversity in the United States and expanding rights, not withdrawing them and not isolating us. And, you know, I, can't, I don't know what he would have believed today. Nobody knows, but I think that was the general thought. And he did have one south of the border moment and that is, um, he supported the idea that any Mexican citizen who lived in the, in the area that was ceded to the United States by the treaty after the war could, if they chose, become an American citizen without any waiting period. So that, I mean, he, I said this to Christian the other day, he was much more suspicious of Canadians than he was of <laughs> Mexicans. Thank you so much. You're Carol. welcome. Thank you all